Welcome to One Off Coder. I'm Dr. G. Vang, and today I'm going to talk about Java data containers. What do I mean by data containers? I mean very simple, lightweight objects that can be used to store logically coherent values. These could be known as plain old Java objects or POJOs, data transfer objects or DTOs, value objects, entities, etc. Technically, these concepts do not mean the same thing, though they do share the commonality of storing data. POJOs are used heavily in backend coding like Enterprise Java Beans or EJBs. DTOs are used to carry information between the backend and front end. Value objects come from Domain Driven Design or DDD. And entities deal with translating data between a persistent storage system and objects. So what do I mean by a data container? Again, I mean something simple and lightweight that can contain logically coherent data. These data containers may be ad hoc or general purpose to a system. They may or may not have business logic, relate to entire systems, or have anything to do with databases. I find myself many times wanting to quickly store data, but I often find myself writing full-blown classes when all I needed was a simple way to keep logical data points together. There is a consequence to using simple data containers. Take Martin Fowler's idea of an anemic object. An anemic object has state but no behavior. Martin says that when objects are anemic, one consequence is that we end up writing transactional code. Think of transactional code as code close to spaghetti code, where the processing logic is likely to be spread across your API. Martin says that anemic objects are antithetical to object-oriented programming. They are an anti-pattern and should be avoided. Take the opposing view that object-oriented programming, or OOP, is evil. Yes, there is such a school of thought. If the null reference invented by Sir Tony Hoare was the billion-dollar mistake, OOP is the trillion-dollar mistake. The trillion dollar mistake includes OOP's problems with abstraction obsession, mutability, and concurrency. I'm not here to argue these things. I think computer programming is an art, as emphasized by Donald Knuth. I think we have to balance between beautiful rich class definitions and beautiful functional code. Anyways, let's see what Java has to offer for simply storing data. When I first started coding, the best and most disciplined way to store compound data was with using classes or OOP. Over the years, I became a polyglot and dabbled in JavaScript and Python. I became quite proficient or at least very confident in solving problems using these languages. I read and wrote a lot of JavaScript and Python code. It was incredible how JavaScript object notation or JSON came to dominate the world. JSON was just so easy, I could have only stayed if I wanted to, and it was quite easy to add behavior later. Python supports dictionaries as a first-class citizen. In fact, creating a dictionary in Python was almost like creating a JSON object. Dictionaries are flexible and adaptable in Python. For example, I can easily create a pandas data frame from a list of dictionaries and gain the power of tabular data with vectorized operations. Of course, out of the box, Python dictionaries aren't specialized like classes. They're general purpose associative arrays. If you need to create business logic around a Python dictionary, that code is likely to reside elsewhere, not on the dictionary itself. Looking at Java, things are tough with dictionaries or the map. In particular, initializing a map is tough. Why does it have to be this tough? I went to balding.com and the nightmare continues. There's about six major ways documented to initialize a map in Java, and they all have their weaknesses or idiosyncrasies. Take the Java collection approach, where we can use the collection class to create a singleton map. In this approach, we can only create a map with a single entry. How useful is this? In Java 8, we can use streams and combinations with collectors to map to create a map. OK, but I'm scared because of the two-dimensional array and also because of the nested curly braces and parentheses. Now, I've done this type of coding for years, and so I'm used to it. But that doesn't mean I don't make mistakes. I often do. Think about newcomers. How do we educate newcomers to Java just to get used to this idiom? Nearly impossible, in my opinion. The map entry approach is almost like the collectors to map code. But look at all the new operators I have to use. I was taught that using new was evil at some point in my career, or maybe this feeling was a carryover from C++. I've learned stuff throughout the years, and they've become such a hard-earned habit that I've lost the original reason why I do these habits. Oh, this code snippet is cool, right? Because we're using the method reference operator, those double colons to avoid defining lambdas. 
I don't know, this code still looks scary to me. Java 9 has an easier way to initialize a map with map of. This code snippet doesn't look so scary. The only thing is, what's the key and what's the value? Every other element is a key, and every following element to a key is its value. Try remembering that. I didn't write the code in a long form and wrote it in a wide form. If I wrote this code in wide form, I think my intention would not be clear and I may end up violating code formatting rules. Here's the biggest catch. We are limited to at most 10 key value pairs using map of. This limitation doesn't make any sense after working with JSON and JavaScript and dictionaries and Python. I think I'll pass on this approach if I have a lot of fields. I used to hang out with some cool kids and they love Google's Guava library. Yes, Guava seemed to be the missing API of Java, but I never latched onto it much. Anyway, using Guava's immutable map of, I can also initialize a map like Java 9's map of. But the situation is even worse with Guava. First, I have to add a dependency to Guava. Have you ever been in a code review and you've added an external dependency? I have. It doesn't fare well to your code base or managing complexity by adding external dependencies. Try not to. Imagine all the transitive dependencies that might be dragged in. That was one hard-earned lesson I learned. Oh, and also, what about building Uber jars? You know those jars that contain all other binary code from your dependencies? Frequently, if you're building an Uber jar and you've got a lot of dependencies, what you end up with might not even be compatible. Oh, and second, I thought I might mention, whereas Java 9's map of allows you up to 10 key value pairs, Guava's immutable map of allows only up to 5. This is mind boggling. Here's a somewhat nice way of initializing a map. This approach is called the double brace syntax way of initializing a map. Not the most exciting name, let's call it the double mustache way. So I like this approach a lot. I can tolerate it. I don't have to worry about streams or collectors. I just have to put up with put, no pun intended. But what's the problem? It creates extra anonymous classes at every stage of put, holds hidden references to the enclosing object, and might even cause memory leaks. Yikes, definitely a pass. I didn't even really consider or use tuples in Java until I started working with JavaScript and Python, especially Python. In Python, tuples are a first-class citizen. Python tuples are easy to work with as you can access elements in a tuple using bracket and index notation. Python improves tuple with the idea of named tuples, where you can assign names to elements and instead of using bracket and index notation to access an element, you can use dot notation. JavaScript, on the other hand, doesn't have tuples, but tuples can be easily emulated using arrays. One cool thing about tuples in both JavaScript and Python is pulling values from a tuple. JavaScript calls this destructuring and Python calls this unpacking. They both are trying to do the same thing, get certain elements out from an array or a tuple. Java has no native support for tuples. Scala does, and Scala is a Java virtual machine or JVM-based language. But the native support of tuples in Scala is limited in that a tuple in Scala can have at max 22 elements. I guess Scala is better than Java because at least it tries to be modern with its features. But let's not try to get into Scala as I am still recovering from self-inflicted concussions working with Scala. So if Java doesn't support tuples, why am I talking about it then? Well, because you can get tuples with external dependencies. The external dependency I'm talking about is the Java Tuples API. You can find this library on Maven Central. Let's just see how this library works because, again, I'm trying to show ways to store data in Java. Although, I am violating my own philosophy of avoiding external dependencies. So I've learned about tuples as n number of things. For example, a two tuple has two things, a three tuple has three things, and so on. A two tuple is naturally called a pair. Here, my pair is a first and last name. There's four ways to instantiate a pair. One is directly with a pair constructor. Another is using the pair with method. We can also create a pair from a collection using pair from collection. Lastly, we can create a pair from an array using pair from array. Not bad, I would say, pretty simple. I forgot to mention, but tuples are immutable, meaning once you create them, they can never be altered. Using the Java tuple library, you can have up to 10 tuples of things. Each of these tuples have a name, starting with a one tuple, which is called a unit. Then you have a pair, 
triplet, quartet, quintet, and so on, up to a 10-tuple called a decade. I'm using the specific tuple name and its associated with function to instantiate the tuples here. All the tuple types have tuple as a part of its inheritance. Thus, I can create an array of tuples from the tuples and iterate over them to print each. Accessing elements from a tuple is done with the getValues method. If I want the first element, I call getValue0. If I want the second element, I call the getValue1 method. This is bad because getValue0, getValue1, and so on are meaningless. What does 0 correspond to? What does 1 correspond to? If I don't want to use getValue0, getValue1, and so on, I can call getValue and pass in the index of the element that I want. When I attempt to pass in an invalid index, let's say phi for a quintet tuple, then an illegal argument exception will be thrown. The functions getValue0, getValue1, and so on seem to protect me more from hurting myself, but are meaningless. Calling getValue with an index is also meaningless, but now I can specify an invalid index. I don't know which one of the two is worse. I can set and add values to a tuple. I have a quintet here, and when I set or add values to the quintet, a new tuple is created. Setting a value on a tuple does not mutate the tuple, it just creates a new immutable tuple whose specified index takes on the new value. Note that calling set at, the resulting new tuple is still a quintet. Adding a value to a tuple does change its type. Since we have a quintet here, adding another value will return a sextet. Removing values from a tuple is accomplished by invoking the removeFrom methods. These method names have the index appended at the end, so they're foolproof. Ironically, there's no removeFrom method where you can pass in an index. Note that when we invoke removeFrom, the resulting tuple is a quartet. Converting from a tuple to a list or array is easy. We can invoke the toList or toArray methods. Here, the resulting list will have a type of object, and the same for the array. So it seems to get around the quirkiness of maps and tuples, I might have to actually revert to writing a full-blown class. I like maps and tuples because they don't have rigid structures, but they're too hard to work with in Java. I still don't want to write a full-blown class just to store data. Well, I know about metaprogramming, and I know about annotations in Java. In Python and TypeScript, annotations go by the name of decorators. In Java, the Lombok library has become the de facto library for annotating classes to reduce boilerplate code. Annotations have been around for a while in Java. They're used everywhere from Spring to Hibernate to JPA. Here, I create a person class and go to town on annotating the class. I add getters and setters. I add a constructor with required arguments. I can control the getters and setters to be fluent. I even get a builder by adding the at builder annotation. Lastly, I get the toString, equals, and hash code functions by adding the appropriate annotations. Oh, and this person class will be immutable. Notice the final keyword on all the fields and the at non null annotation. Look at how I instantiate three person objects p1, p2, and p3. P1 and P2 are created using the constructor. P3 is created using the builder. This is great, or is it? Because look at all the annotations polluting my code now. Up to now, I've complained much about Java and the difficulties with maps, tuples, and annotated classes. Maps are hard to initialize and severely limited. Tuples are supported only by third-party libraries, but remain difficult to work with. Annotations on classes are a big win, but when do I get to code? Java records were a preview feature in Java 14 and is now supported in Java 15. If Java is moving in any right direction, in my opinion, records are it. I would liken Java records to Python data classes. They both work like classes, but can remain as simple as data containers. If you want, certainly you can add behavior. Let me show an example of a record here. I'm creating a person record with only two fields first and last names. Out of the box, a record will create boilerplate code for us, namely to string, equals, and hash code. Just to show you that a record doesn't have to be anemic, I've added the getFullName method. To test out this person record, I've created three person record instances, p1, p2, and p3. Now, p1 and p2 store the same data, but p3 doesn't. If I print p1, I get a very sensible string representation. 
If I compare if P1 is equal to P2, the result should be true. If I compare if P1 is equal to P3, the result should be false. The hash codes for P1 and P2 should be the same, and P3 should be different. Accessing the fields on a record is done using dot notation. We don't have to deal with bracket index notation that is verbose and error prone. Lastly, I can evoke any method that I've defined on the person record. This is an improvement. Maps? No. Tuples? No. Classes and annotations? No. Records? Yes and yes and yes. I'm done complaining, but I do have a wish list for Java. Please enable string interpolation like f-strings in Python, template literals in JavaScript, or interpolated strings in C-sharp. Thanks for watching. We'd love to hear your feedback to create better and new content. Please contact us by going to our website at https oneoffcoder.com. Until next time, happy coding, happy learning.